touch the ocean of God's love. That's our sermon title today. It's also the gospel invitation to you. Touch the ocean of God's love. Been reading, uh, returning to read from Corey Tinboom and uh, one of her great comments is that you never so touch the ocean of God's love as when you love and forgive your enemies. You never so touch the ocean of God's love as when you love and forgive your enemies. We are spending some time, we introduced it last Sunday, as we moved from the four beatitudes and four woes or warnings that Jesus gives at the opening of his Sermon on the Plain, a different sermon than the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain that we read uh, in Luke chapter 6. And we have moved from, and the message of Jesus flows from, the four beatitudes and the four woes or warnings into his command Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Be merciful, even as your Father in heaven as, is merciful. That, that last one is the frame verse on what we're reading today. Uh, Jesus gives us a command. You'll remember from last Sunday, we said, love, in this case, is a verb. It's actually a, an imperative. It's a commandment. In the Bible, love is predominantly used as a verb, and that reminds us that love is primarily a verb. Love can also be a noun, an adjective, an adverb, you know, or in, in various forms, loving, this type of thing. But the key message of the Bible is love is not just a feeling. Love is action. So Jesus commands us, to love our enemies in action, and to clarify that, he goes into a whole lot of examples, beginning with making this very clear, do good, do good things, things of God to those who hate you, and all the way through to say, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful because you're children of God if you're saved in Jesus. But I want to also begin with, at least briefly, reminding you of the clarification I gave on this commandment and this series of commandments that Jesus gives to us. I gave it to you last Sunday as well. To make very clear, this is not a commandment to condone, calling for you individually to condone, or God forbid, to subject yourself, or God really forbid, to subject uh, little ones who are in your care, for instance, to domestic abuse to terrorism, and to violent crime. That is not what this is calling you to do. This is not like, oh, y'all just come on in, rape and pillage in my own home. That is not the love that Jesus is calling for. And to remind you what I said last week, this command is clearly to the kingdom people. In other words, Jesus' disciples, the church called out to be a light to the world. It's given as a commandment to us together. As, again, fancy language, the eschatological people of God who are called to bring a new light of the new creation under the new covenant to the world to be a different kind of people. So all of this, again, to go to the passage, is second person plural. He's not pulling somebody aside and saying, you individually, I want you to somehow pull this off on your own. That is, that is not what he's saying. And he's not saying, you individually, just go back to that abusive situation and, and subject your children to it. No, that's not what this is saying. This is all second person. But I say to you, sec, a group, okay, you all, y'all who hear, if you hear me, Jesus says, and then all of the, all of the verbs, all of the imperatives here are second person person plural. Love, second person plural. Agapata, your enemies. Do good to those who hate you, plural, as the people of God. And then going on, uh, let's go on to the next line, if we can, Jack. Nope, it's stuck. That's all right. All right, well, anyway, it's all in second person plural. Now, with that understood, with those qualifications understood, this is a call to the people of God together. Uh, let's move on to Luke 
chapter 2, verses 27 through 36, our, our key scripture for today. And I'm also going to read Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Lord, open our hearts to your word. Speak to us that we might be transformed and be your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, this is Jesus, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic, or in other words, your shirt, either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from the one who takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do to them likewise. If you love those who love you, what credit, or literally what grace, charis, is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit or grace is that to you? For even the sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit, what grace is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. And then continuing, let me read on. I may not have this on the screen. I don't know. Is it up on the screen, Jack? We're continuing? Okay, good. Apologies about that. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit, what grace is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good to them and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. And now to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and our key verse from this, verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because... God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Corey Ten Boom, you never so touch the ocean of God's love as when you love and forgive your enemies. I know, he said to Corey Ten Boom in 1947, God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, will you forgive me? Remind you about Corey Ten Boom. She and her aged father and her sister in Harlem in the Netherlands, in Holland, <coughs> They, for several years, saved the lives of, I think, over 800 Jews and various other resistance fighters who were working against the National Socialist Party of the Netherlands and the German occupation of the Netherlands. 
the, the, the Ten Boom family, they were amazing. Casper Ten Boom, a, a wonderful watchmaker and jeweler, uh, for years had had his shop there with the home above, you know, with the rooms and the apartments above. Uh, over, over, the, over several years, each, in each sequence they started, they would hide six or seven or eight people, and then those people would then be able to escape through the underground system. And over several years, the Ten Boom family saved over 800 Jewish people from being sent to concentration camps and uh, dozens of resistance fighters who were involved in the underground resistance to the Nazi uh, control of the Netherlands. Ten Boom family. But you know, then uh, in early 1944, someone whom Corey tried to help actually not only took her money that she raised for him, but turned the family in. And over the course, of the, basically Corey and her sister Betsy ended up in three different concentration camps, the third one being the worst, that's where they stayed the longest, that's where Betsy, Corey's older sister, died in Ravensbrook. Casper, the dad, who was 80 when he was taken you know, prisoner by the Nazis and thrown into a concentration camp, died uh, within a few weeks in the first concentration camp. Uh, through an amazing act of God, Corey uh, not only survived, but actually through a, a clerical error was released a number of months before the war was even over, and she became a great evangelist, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the war-devastated Europe and even going to Germany to bring the gospel to the same people who had been involved, so to speak, one way or another in a regime that led to the death of her father, to her brother being killed as a resistance fighter against the Nazis, uh, to uh, her sister, her beloved sister, uh, Betsy, dying there in Ravensbrück. So uh, just fast forward, here she is. Uh, you know, she's gonna end up writing The Hiding Place, which if, if you've never read The Hiding Place, if you've never read it with your uh, preteen and teen children, you need to read The Hiding Place. It's a great uh, book about Christian faith in the, in the face of travail. But anyway, so there she is. She's in 1947. She's doing this tour, bringing the gospel to Germany, and she's in Munich. And the man comes up. In 1947, she says, I travel from Holland to the defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. And here's what she would say. It's a great message. When we confess our sins, I would say to the audiences, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever, when we confess our sin to God. You know, as a person from Holland, she's into the sea and how deep it is. So she, uh, she said, God cast that into the sea. At the, at the end of one meeting, I saw him working his way forward, right towards me in the crowd. Now, I saw him as he was, a balding, heavyset German man in a brown overcoat a felt hat clutched between his hands. But then I recognized him and remembered him as he had been at Ravensbrook concentration camp. A cruel guard in a blue uniform and a visored cap with skull and crossbones. Ravensbrook came back to me in a rush. A huge room, its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of clothes and shoes, and the shame of all of us as women walking past this man as he examined us in our nakedness. I could see again my sister's frail, naked form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath her parchment-thin skin. Betsy, how thin you became before you died. Now he was in front of me, and he thrust out his hand. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. You mentioned the Ravensbrook prison in your talk. I, I was a guard there once. But since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips too. Fraulein, will you forgive me? and he reached out his hand. Love your enemies. Like I said, it's a verb. It's a command. It's an imperative verb. What does Jesus call us to? He says, love your enemies, do what? 
to those who hate you? Get them back? Do worse to them than they did to you? No, do good to those who hate you. If you're following along with the notes, you want to write that in. Do good, good things. Bless those who curse you. What about those who abuse you? What are you supposed to do for them? Curse them back? Talk badly about them all over town? Defame them? Pray. Pray. That's the way you fill in that blank. For those who abuse you. Those are words from our Lord Jesus. Today we are back to this issue of, and Dean, I hope Dean's around. Dean, Dean likes these, these three, uh, you know, the alliteration thing. So I'm, I'm back to the alliteration thing. I didn't use it in one sermon recently. He said, I would gotten really used to your, okay. So I have it for you today. Crisis, conversion, calling. Crisis, conversion, calling. This crisis certainly confronted Corey Ten Boom the author of The Hiding Place. Can you imagine that in 1947? Uh, but she had been confronted numerous times, like the times in the concentration camp where she was hating the people who were not so much abusing her, but abusing her beloved sister who was slowly but surely dying, becoming very ill and dying. There's a time when Corey just absolutely hated a prison concentration camp matron whom Corey nicknamed the snake because she wore this shiny dress underneath her official garb. Um, and this woman would carry a whip around and whip the women from time to time. Corey called her the snake and she was telling Betsy one night after they'd been brutalized how much she hated the snake. This is in Ravensbrück concentration camp. And Betsy, Corey's saintly older sister said, don't hate Corey. Pray for that woman. She said that about the snake. And here's what, here's what Betsy said. They know how to hate. And look what it's done to them. They know how to hate. And look what it's done to them. Jesus' command brings us into a crisis confronts each of us, takes us to the refining fire of the cross and the fact that Jesus took on all sin and evil at the cross and he calls us to himself to be saved at the foot of the cross. I mean, that's a crisis. If you're going to be serious, if, you, if, the, if the cross is just not a decoration you wear around your neck or maybe put up at a church, but if you actually understand who Jesus is and what he went through for, for us, for all of us on the cross, it's a crisis to even begin to listen to him call us in the way of the cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Come to me at the cross. It's a crisis. It's a refining fire. I talked about this last Sunday. Just remember that. So Christ's command takes us to the crucible, the refining fire of his atoning and sanctifying and justifying work at the cross. Why? Well, number one, to set us free to trust in God our Father and his fully sufficient blessings for us. See, in other words, Jesus at the cross was called to trust in God, his Father, alone. Everybody bailed out on him. Our sin was placed upon him. There, there was this great crisis of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Leading into Psalm 22, great prophetic psalm. But th there he is, Jesus, at that crisis, called to trust in God, his Father, and he, you know, in Gethsemane too, right? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus calls us in the same way to trust in our Father when we face great challenges. So that's, that's part of the crisis. That's why the crisis. And Christ's command takes us also to the crucible of the cross. Why? Number two, so that we are reconciled to God and become Christ's ambassadors. To the world, and yes, that means even to our enemies, and even to enemies of God. So let's go over this a little bit. Crisis. Crisis actually is going to lead to conversion. Now, I know a lot of times in typical lay Christian parlance, we talk about, well, when I got converted, that's, that's a moment at which I signed a card on one, 
you know, a five minute sequence of my life or whatever. No, no, no. There's a whole lot of conversion going on in the whole process, not only in our justification, but also our sanctification and our glorification in Christ. There's an ongoing <laughs> conversion happening. The Bible tells us this. So uh, the crisis is to set us free to trust in God our Father and his fully sufficient blessings. And the crisis leads to our conversion in Christ, okay, our being changed, and our calling that he gives us. So we're reconciled to God in order to, you see, our calling is to become ambassadors for Jesus, the one who went to the cross for you and me, to be his ambassadors to the world, including to people we don't naturally like and people who are supposedly our enemies and certainly people who are enemies of God. Now, I won't go over all this that we talked about Wednesday night. You know, you, you, many of you are there, you're watching the resources, or listening to the resources, but just remember when um, Luther and Melanchthon and the early Protestant reformers talk about a faith that actually saves an effectual faith. Remember, we talked Wednesday night. We've broken this out for you in our, in our Bible studies and theology studies. I did this last Wednesday night. That when you talk about sola fide, saved by faith alone, it's not cheap grace, but it leads to the kind of fides viva that Martin Luther talks about, a living faith, a fruitful faith. And so, therefore, it's not merely, as Melanchthon graphed out for us, and we looked at that Wednesday night, not merely notitia, and not even notitia and a census, not even that I have the message of the gospel, and not even that, well, yeah, I agree with that. No, th those are essential to salvation, right? But, but those are not enough. As we saw and studied Wednesday night, fiducia is essential. You actually have a trusting relationship in which a new life begins, in the life of trusting in God. So fiducia is essential. The Protestant reformers were all clear on this. No, 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 Roman church, we're not talking about a cheap grace uh, faith here. Let's move that to the parallel, though. You'll hear this from me again. We live in the information age. You know that, right? We thought the late 20th century was the information age, but the late 20th century doesn't even hold a candle to the 21st century. You know, internet, whatever search engine you use, you can access more information, more data than you can even begin to absorb in a lifetime in a matter of minutes. Did you all know that? I mean, it's true. You really can. We live in a... But, is information going to save us? No, no. Saving faith is more than information. It's more than listening to a podcast. It's more than looking something up in the midst of when I'm doing five different things. Oh, this is what this preacher says, or this is what this Bible verse says. Therefore, I've got the gospel. I'm good. Let's keep moving. No, no, no. No, no, no. Saving faith is much more than information, in, more than, in a sense, kind of parallel notitia, right? It's also a couple of other things. Let's fill in these blanks. It's also appropriation. In other words, I'm going to take this as my own. It's not just information out there. I'm going to come into this information and own this information and be owned by this information. That's appropriation. But then also, that's not enough, right? The appropriation needs to lead to what? Fill in that blank. Transformation. I need to be changed change from the inside out. And God does that through the gospel if I truly am born anew in the spirit. So this is what Paul is talking about, for instance, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It's the verse we talked a lot about with, the, with those guys uh, who are in for, in many cases, for 30, 40 life sentences um, yesterday. Romans 12, 2, conversion. Conversion is not just a matter of a moment of salvation, but also an ongoing part of our sanctification, our being united with Jesus, our union with Jesus. So, Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Do you all see that? Be transformed, be changed, be truly converted. By what? By the renewal of of your mind, by the renewal of your mind, so that by testing, now that here's the this process is not over that. Now it's still going. This is the transformation. So that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. So this is an ongoing life 
of being transformed and converted unto Christ. That's what, that's what the Bible is talking about. That's what real faith is talking about. So back to our application. Conversion. What's an example of conversion? I pull this quotation from F.F. F. Bruce, an old New Testament scholar from the 20th century. Um, he says, persistence in prayer for someone we don't like brings a remarkable change in attitude. If you make yourself, if you submit yourself to God to actually continually pray for someone that you don't naturally like, God will, by his grace, bring a change in your attitude. This doesn't mean I do it one time. This is like an ongoing lifetime of prayer for that enemy, okay? So the conversion is in process, and that leads us into our calling. What are we supposed to do? Over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. Let me just highlight, this is key now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, the second part of it, Paul says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, let me make this clear. Paul is talking to Christians. This is not people who are unsaved. So again, the point of conversion and really the point of sanctification is an ongoing story. I, I want you to understand this. Paul is addressing people who have believed in Jesus, who are part of the church in Corinth, and he implores them to be reconciled to God. What is he talking about? I thought I'm already saved. I thought I'm already a Christian. And he's saying, yes, but I want you to be reconciled to God, your Father, who is merciful to everyone, including enemies, who brings, who loves the world so much that's in rebellion against him that he gives his one and only son. I want you to know the real God. I want you to be reconciled <clears throat> and at peace, not just with your own concerns and I've got this guilt issue and this and that. No, no, to be really at peace with God is to know who God really is, who the Father really is, the one who is merciful. So he says, I implore you, be reconciled to God. So back to the issue of how we see things, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one. Now that includes our enemies and people we don't actually like. We regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. And Jesus commands us, love your enemies. I want you to think for a minute. There are some people that you regard in the flesh, let's just be honest. You regard them out of your own emotions, out of past things that have happened. The Bible, the Word of God, is calling you to be reconciled to God so that you begin to see them the way they could be in Jesus. So Paul says, we don't, we don't you know, saved as apostolic leaders, we don't regard people that way anymore, and you shouldn't either. I'm urging you to be reconciled to God. So the conversion leads then to our calling, not only the way we see them, but our outreach to them. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and did what? Well, that's nice. I got reconciled to God, but wait a minute. Let's keep reading. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, I'm supposed to go to people that I may not like and that aren't already Christian and share the good news with them and love them and pray for them. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. There's your calling. God making his appeal to other people, including people you might not naturally like and want to hang out with, even people who you think are your enemies, to be God's ambassador to them. That's a high calling. That's a high calling. So, be reconciled to God. Making his, we implore you, therefore, on behalf of Christ, you're not going to be a good ambassador unless you're reconciled to God and understand who God is as the one who's reaching out to those same people. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. I was just delighted a couple weeks ago uh, to learn about two tribes in southern e Ethiopia who've had an ongoing feud for generations, and they fight over borders all the time. The Mescon tribe and the Morocco tribe. And you know what? When the Jesus film, which is a film that, uh, you know, 
turns into a movie, The Gospel of Luke. It's been used for multiple decades in evangelism in the third world. When the Jesus film was being translated into the Mara language, the Christians, and let me make this clear, Christians are a small minority in these Muslim dominant areas, okay? The Mara Christians said, they said this, they said, look, if the gospel is coming for us, we want it to come for them also. The tribe that's always been their hated enemies, that fights them all the time, that kills their kids, you know, in wars and battles. They said, if the gospel is gonna come to us, we want it to go to our enemy tribe too. And this summer, the, the Jesus film has reached hundreds and hundreds from both tribes and hundreds have become Christian just in the last few months. Isn't that awesome? Jesus says, but love your enemies and do good to them. Lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. John Piper says, the command to love your enemy is a command to find your hope and satisfaction in God and his great reward, not in the way people treat you. So you gotta decide how you live in your life. Is your reward in the way people treat you and what they think of you? Or is your reward with God your Father? I wanna invite you to the gospel to know God your Father is enough. His love for you is enough. So back to Corey Ten Boom. Now, he was in front of me, and he thrust out his hand. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. You mentioned the Ravensbrook prison in your talk. I was a guard there. But since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear from your lips as well. Fraulein, will you forgive me? And he reached out his hand. What would you do? She writes, and as I stood there, I could not speak. I had to forgive him. I knew that. Jesus says, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being as I reached out my hand bringing me to tears. I forgive you, brother, as I held his hand, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands. He, the former guard, and I, the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. She was reconciled, you understand, not only to this guard, but to her Father in heaven. She knew his love. She touched the ocean of God's love that has no end. And she was set free. I want to invite you to be set free. Corey says this, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. You don't have to produce the love. He's going to give it to you. Romans 5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And as Corey says, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. His love prevails. Do you believe? Come to Jesus come to the Father and live in the power of his love. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
Let's we pray. hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.